The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. U.S. mail. I've always wanted to yell that at the beginning of a podcast. It's mailbag day, everybody. It's mailbag day on Fantasy NBA Today. Welcome to the pod. We got questions coming in from the Twitter land. They were sent to me, at Dan Bespris. You can follow me on Twitter if you'd like as well. And I'm going to get you answers on a lot of those questions. We're also going to talk to Chef. You might also know him as Floppy Divots or just Ali. He is a hoop ball pro. He is running that thread we were talking about on yesterday's podcast. It's a, it's a rate my team thread where effectively anybody, anybody in almost any kind of league, I'm sure there's some limitations to it, but if you've got a team out there, you just finished drafting it, and you want somebody who is really, really good at this stuff to take a look at your thread or your, uh, excuse me, your team, it's in a thread, uh, Ali's doing that at HoopBall right now. It's hoop-ball.com. Click on the forums tab. We'll tell you more about it later on on today's podcast. We're also, as I mentioned, we got a lot of these great mailbag questions as we lead our way up to the season. It's going to be a lot of fun on today's show. There's some really deep dive mailbag questions. There's some really hyper-specific ones. But if there's anything that I really, truly noticed about the mailbag, it's that everybody wants to talk about DeAndre Ayton right now and confirms our suspicions that wacky and wild and wonderful things that happened during the preseason do have an impact on fantasy draft season as well. Welcome to the show. It's Wednesday's edition. Uh, thank you to everybody that continues to tune into this podcast. This time of year in particular, I want to stress over and over and over again how unbelievably grateful I am for all the listenership. This was, I believe actually, and I've said this before on the podcast, it's a weird thing. Um, our, our shows are hosted through Libsyn. It's the podcast host platform they're a pretty large company they operate on greenwich mean time i don't know why maybe they're based out of greenwich i'm not certain but that's what it is so the days run from like 4 p.m to 4 p.m or something like that i might be getting this wrong uh anyway the 24 hours between 4 p.m monday and 4 p.m on tuesday was the largest listenership we've ever had in a 24-hour period. It was just a, a smattering of different episodes. The Tuesday show yesterday with Kyle McEwen, uh, the Monday show breaking down the DeJounte Murray injury, Mark Roberts and uh, Philip Dean of the Grizzlies, and then Brewski's show on Friday is already our most listened to podcast of all time and counting it's only Wednesday. That show is less than a week ago. We often have many, uh, I would say probably 20 to 30% of the listenership usually trickles in over the next uh, two to three weeks after a show airs, and it's already the most listened to episode of all time. This is, it's just a very exciting time for me to see this type of stuff, to see what appears to be a lot of effort paying off in you guys finding the podcast, listening to it, and I, and I love you for it. And so what I'm going to do here at the beginning of the show is, number one, I want to thank everybody for listening to the podcast, especially right now. But also, I'm going to beg. I'm getting down on a knee again. Every day this week, I am begging all of you that are finding the podcast for the first time or finding it again, a second go-around, so sort of a first time, like a first time again, to please, please, whatever you use to listen to podcasts, whether it's Google Play or iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or iHeart or YouTube or just some RSS feed interpreter, please subscribe to the show and please find a way to rate the podcast, uh, particularly if you want to give it a nice marks. But almost regardless, those types of things are what allow us to sort of take off. It's a springboard. It's a positive feedback loop. When one person finds the pod rates it, and subscribes to it. That's the biggest part. Subscribing to it is so important. When one person does that, it pushes the podcast up the charts so more people can find it, and then those people will hear my next plea to subscribe to the show, and hopefully it'll be almost like a pyramid where that number continues to grow. We can continue to do more fun stuff here at Hoop Ball, uh, and I can continue to thank you for it. 
I'm Dan Vespers. I said that already uh, because I gave you my Twitter handle. The HoopBall Twitter handles are at HoopBallFantasy and at HoopBallTweets. And I want to remind everybody once more to please check out Neil and Adrian, my two guys, Neil Rochlani, Adrian Benjamins, who subbed in here on Fantasy NBA today. They've got their own show now. It comes out in the evenings. It's going to be getting released at the end of box scores every night. When the games finish, the podcast comes out. It breaks down the action every night through the season And they'll give you add and drop recommendations based on what they just saw happen on their television and scouring the box scores. It's called the Box Score Breakdown. It's available at HoopBall as well. Plan for today's episode. We're going to do some mailbag questions. We're going to talk to Chef. We're going to go back to some more mailbag questions. Then we're going to wrap it up and get you situated for tomorrow's show, which will actually be me talking to Neil. Neil's coming back on to grace us with his presence, the newly minted podcast host, And then Friday, we'll talk to Brew. That'll be sort of a preseason retrospective because by Friday, a lot of us have done our drafts. We're going to be looking back at what those results were, what we're learning from it. Last year, we called it the sleeper retrospective, and people seem to like that. So maybe I'll just give it the same title again, and uh, we'll see how that thing shakes itself out. Sound good? Excellent. Let's dig into the mailbag. Take the lid off that bad boy. Or is it a, I don't know, is it a mailbag or is it a mailbox? Sort of a mailbox, right? You guys put the letter in. I got to flick the little flag up so that I know there's a letter in the mailbox. Anyway, I'm opening up the mailbox. Uh, question number one, and I did organize this one. I wanted to do this question first because I thought this was a really good one to come out of the shoot with. This is for our buddy Beans, uh, at Beans for Prez on Twitter. How much do you alter your rankings when drafting head-to-head versus Roto? Is there a premium on certain positions or categories? Like, for instance... The B-150 splits between eight and nine categories, but it is technically built for Roto. I'm curious how much would change versus another format. That's a great question, and there are a lot of pieces to it. Let's start with the B-150 side. Those of you that are premium subscribers, if you have the B-150, if you have the draft guide, then you have it by association, hoop-ball.com, click on the premium tab if you'd like to get that. But we're not going to get into the actual numbers in the B-150. What we are going to talk about is the fact that it lists that it is for Roto. What does that mean? Well, it means that it's not taking into account when games might be missed, but it is taking into account how many. So if there's a player like, let's take, for example, a decent or a, a, a mediocre team with a decent player on it, the Cleveland Cavaliers come to mind as a team that's probably not going to be very good, but probably will have a guy in Kevin Love who's putting up big numbers. And if or when they get eliminated from playoff contention, there's a chance he might take, you know, three of the last 10 games off. In Roto, that just means you subtract three games from his overall total. You don't care when it happens. You're still going to get, in this hypothetical example, 79 other games that he could potentially play. So you build your ranking based on that. In head-to-head, you do have to be aware. You say, okay, well, if he's going to miss three games at the end of the year, okay, 79 games the rest of the way. How many of those is he going to play? Great, great, great. But if I plan on making the semifinals or finals in my head-to-head league, I have to be aware that this guy might be a drop candidate. So for me, personally, when I'm looking at head-to-head versus Roto, I am eliminating the teams that have a awful playoff schedule. Not, like, kind of bad. Those guys... Because there's so many factors that could go into who plays down the stretch. If you have a guy like Kevin Love who... And I don't have his playoff calendar directly in front of me right now, but let's say it's fine. If he misses half of those games, his fine playoff calendar becomes a terrible one. If you have a guy who has a not-great playoff calendar, let's say he plays two fewer games than Love in this hypothetical example, but he plays all of them, then he ends up actually having a better playoff calendar than the guy who should be able to play more games. Does that make sense? No? Okay, fine. My brain is not that great. The point I'm making in a relatively circuitous fashion here is that when you're drafting for head-to-head, you need to be aware of the teams with terrible playoff schedules Good and bad, I mean, a great playoff schedule is awesome, a good playoff schedule is fine, a not great playoff schedule you can still deal with. The ones 
There's usually one or two teams out there that just has an atrocious playoff schedule, and you could probably write those guys off. If you're, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast and you're reading about fantasy sports all the time, you're probably going to be one of the teams that's in contention in your league. Not that many leagues have all 12 teams that are this lasered in, listening to pods and reading articles and doing the whole thing. So I would eliminate those very, very small handful of teams, if even that, probably like one or two. You also want to look at individual players, and when you're assessing injury risk, you want to think about when those might occur. For instance, in a head-to-head league, you probably can't draft Danilo Gallinari. In a roto league, you probably can. Like, you know what, I'm going to draft this guy, knowing he's going to play 50 games this year. His total value is going to be around top 100, but his per-game value is going to be like 45 or 50. You just plug in those 45 games at a top 50 clip, and you understand that at some point during the year, you're probably just going to have to punt him. If it's like, oh, Gallo tweaked a butt muscle, and he's going to be out for four weeks, you just get rid of him. It's not worth sitting on that whole time. That, to me, is the big difference in head-to-head and roto. Otherwise, drafting is fairly similar for me. Speaking on behalf of other people that do both types and having talked to them at great length while doing this podcast, uh, the opportunity to punt comes into play in a head-to-head league and not really in roto. There are very few people who like playing roto leagues who will suggest punting a category in them. Those of us that play in a number of head-to-head leagues, we probably have tried punting from time to time. And it can work. Because if you give up one of the nine categories to be awesome at three or four, that leaves you roughly four, let's say, additional categories, where all you really need to do is be pretty good at two of them. And if you can be really good at two or three, then you're in great shape, especially come playoff time. You can't really do that in a Roto League. Being really, really good in three categories, field goal percent, rebounds, blocks, for instance, let's say you're punting free throw percent. I don't know that you're going to be first place in each, but that still is 37 points, 12, 12, 12, and 1, out of a possible 48 in those. And to match that 37 points, you'd really only need about 9 points in each of those categories. So it's usually not worth the punt. Whereas in head-to-head, the one-on-one battle aspect of it, where all you have to do is get to the next round, you can get away with it. Because simply put, that three to one, that's what that is at that point. That's a three to one. That's a win. You don't have to worry about the three to one. I mean, yes, obviously during the regular season, you want to win as many categories as humanly possible. But at the end of the day, that three to one is a win. That's the important part. And that's why you can get away with that. Good first question. Thank you, Beans. Let's delete that one. We're going to throw that letter out. We're going to move on to the next one. Uh, this is from No Shirt JR. What do you make of the recent news on Jimmy Butler playing even if he's not traded? I drafted him with my second round pick in a 16 team league with Anthony Davis as my first. So I have a safety blanket at least. Right. I mean, oh my God. You have AD and Jimmy Butler in a 16-team league. When did Jimmy go in this league? I would have to think that would be basically pick 32. You are in great shape. Even if he doesn't put up end-of-the-first-round type numbers for the whatever time he's on the Timberwolves, your team is just gonna, is going to crush. That's a crazy one, too. You could end up with the number one guy in fantasy, and if Jimmy Butler actually stays healthy all year, he could be a top 12 guy. You could have two first-round picks in a 16-team league drafting early. You're crushing it. I'm not adjusting Jimmy Butler much. I think he's still going to have a great year, and I almost want him to not play at full tilt for Minnesota. Maybe he won't play himself onto the injured list. I wouldn't worry too much about it. I really wouldn't. And as we talked about back when the news broke of Jimmy Butler demanding a trade, there really aren't that many places he could go where he would take an actual hit in fantasy value. He wants to go to a team, and obviously what he wants is maybe not the most important part of the story, but he wants to go to a team where he's going to be in control. 
even if they send him to a team where he's not, just like Houston, Golden State, these are the very small number of teams where his value would take an obvious and significant hit. If he ends up in Miami, he's going to be the man. If he ends up on the Clippers, he's going to be the man. Most of the places you're hearing the talk, the chatter, he would be the man. And what if we went to Portland? I saw a report that was like, oh, Portland should mortgage the farm for Jimmy Butler. I agree with that, by the way, because it would get them out from a number of bad contracts, most likely. It's the only way that they could make the numbers match, I believe. Or at least one bad contract. Uh, I think they'd probably have to give up either McCollum or Lillard, probably McCollum. So fine, Jimmy Butler might not be the first option on that team, but there's way more than enough meat on that bone. So there's really no place where he could end up where I'm all that worried about it. Uh, and staying in Minnesota might be a blessing. Maybe he only plays 30 minutes a game while he's there just to be on the floor playing and staying in shape. I mean, what's the worst case scenario? He plays like 24 minutes a night. Yeah, that's not very good, but he's still, I mean, I'll tell you what, he's still a top 35 guy in 24 minutes a night. He doesn't need to get to that 35 or whatever he Thibodeau would like him to be doing. So no, I'm not worried about it. You're fine. And Tony O says, how many weeks should the regular season go in a respectable head-to-head league? Hmm. A settings question. The answer to this question to me is relatively simple. I think what you absolutely positively have to do is eliminate the last 10 days of the regular season. You can't have... Here's the problem. If those 10 days occurred somewhere in the middle of the year, nobody would care. Oh, half the good players in the league just played a half this week and a half. They had four games and they played two. They had five games they played three. If that happened from like mid-February, nobody would even pay attention to it. But the problem is that it's the finals. So to me, you have two options. One of them is is viable, and the other one's kind of stupid. Your options are, and we'll start with the stupid one, the stupid option is don't have playoffs in your head-to-head league. Make the winner of your head-to-head league, whoever emerges from the regular season with the best record. That's it. You play up until the very last day, And whoever has the best record against everybody else in the league, head-to-head over that entire stretch, is the winner. I'm actually fine with that. That plays a little bit more like a Roto League because then you have to build a team that can rack up wins on a week-to-week basis. And winning 5-4 to every week will probably not win you the league. That would play more like a Roto format. But if you're in a head-to-head league, you probably want to be in that league maybe because you want to have the competition against whatever group of of friends this might be. Or maybe you don't want to be in a Roto-style league. Maybe that's part of the reason you join this. And for that, you got to get rid of those last 10 days. Because they'd be the finals. Those last 10 days would be the finals. You can't have your league decided the finals in a time when you have no idea who's actually going to be on the court. It's wrong. It's wrong. I'm in a head-to-head money league. I'm only in one. I don't like them, but this is one I've been in for a decade, so it's not going anywhere. And finally, this year, everybody agreed to get rid of the last 10 days. In fact, people had agreed to do it years in the past, but the commissioner never bothered to look for the settings. So this year, I finally said, Commish, make me a co-commissioner. This is my job, to sit on the internet all day and read about fantasy sports and be logged in. That's just my job. I'm going to be logged in to our account, my account, my Yahoo account, as this turns out to be, all the time. So just let me take 20 seconds when I'm eating a corn dog to figure out how to switch this. And it was so easy. I switched it. It's very simple. Find the setting, wherever it might be, in wherever your head-to-head league is, and make sure your league doesn't end at the last day of the season. I happen to be in the group of people that doesn't want to lop off any more than that. I like the fact that you can let a head-to-head league go far. 
I don't want my league ending like two weeks after the All-Star break. That's not fun. I don't want to have a month of games happening that don't matter in my fantasy league. So, yes, there are some people I think that would cut off probably the last 17 or even 24 days of the regular season if they could. I happen to think that's a little bit too early to end your league. But what I do believe is that you absolutely positively must trim the final 10 days. Anything, if you're playing those last 10 days, it better be in a roto format. Simple as that. But beyond that, you know, it's sort of user's choice. I just, I, I love the grind of the fantasy season. I think it's part of what makes me very good at this is that it doesn't intimidate me to be digging in on a night-to-night basis. So I want it to go as long as possible, but I also want it to be decided in a fair manner. Good question. We had two questions here about uh, DeAndre Ayton that actually came in back-to-back. There were three. Uh, One of them I had to just leave out. Um, But here they are. This is from Marlo L. Ram. Who are the players you're willing to reach for in the early, mid, mid, and late middle rounds? Also, where would you take DeAndre Ayton and Luka Doncic? Or Doncic, excuse me, in a nine-cat head-to-head. And Torres P.E. or Torespe, one, wants to know when you draft DeAndre Ayton in a points league. So, first of all, points league, not really my cup of tea. I do think that there's going to be a little bit of overlap because he's going to be okay in free throws, but not great. He's going to have a pretty good field goal percent. Those just don't matter. And, of course, it does depend a little bit on the settings of the points league. I did a points league mock on Wednesday of this week where assists were worth two points. So, in that format, DeAndre Ayton would always get bumped down the list a little bit because he's probably not going to pass at all. Overall, and we talked about this actually on one of the shows with Brew not this most recent one, but the previous one. He was talking about DeAndre Ayton uh, pretty early. I'm a little bit less bullish on some of these young guys, as you know. Uh, Doncic, I'm probably not drafting. I think that he's way overhyped. There's no, there will be no drafts where he falls far enough for him to end up on my team because that would be like 80s, 90s somewhere in that neck of the woods. DeAndre Ayton, I I would venture to say, could go significantly earlier than that because big man stats are just simpler. And what I mean by simpler is that there are fewer places where a young big man can shoot himself in the foot. It's very hard to be a rookie point guard in the NBA because the ball is in your hand. Your field goal percent is going to be atrocious. I don't know if you can shoot free throws yet, and it could be one of the only plays you can salvage your value, and you probably won't. With a big man, and I'm not saying DeAndre Ayton is going to be anything like Carl Anthony Towns or Anthony Davis, but it's just easier because if your free throw percentage is not that good, it's forgivable. Because if you're going to be on the floor for 30 minutes a night, you're going to get high percentage looks around the rim. You're going to rebound. You're going to get some blocked shots. You're going to get some steals. You probably won't have to turn it over all that much unless you're you know, orchestrating the offense a little bit more like Joel Embiid. So for Aiton, I think the floor is higher. Obviously, with a guy like Doncic, over time, he's going to become a very interesting fantasy player. I just I don't believe in the fact that The Mavs are just going to let him run with it this year. I don't think it's going to happen that soon. Uh, So for Doncic, like I said, you know, 80s, 90s, he's never going to fall as far as I would want him to. Aiton, I think you can take him in that second big cluster of centers that stretches all the way from the beginning of the third round to the beginning of the fifth round. Somewhere in there is where you're going to see him going. Uh, In a head-to-head league, I think... His value is probably pretty close to the same as it is in a roto format. I'm not too worried about injuries or restings or whatever you may have. Um, So, yeah, I I would put him in that grouping. And I think everybody wants to talk about Jared Allen. I think I'd rather have DeAndre Ayton, frankly, just because of minutes. You guys really love DeAndre Ayton. He's he's the buzz guy right now. He's going to start getting drafted too soon. This question is from Giraffe Goodies. (laughs) Uh, Who are your top picks 
for injury stashes in head-to-head leagues with IR slots, and what draft position would you consider them? Nobody. If you listen to this podcast, you know this is my stance, so I'm just going to repeat myself. Nobody. And you say, but Dan, I have an IR slot. I have nothing to lose. Baloney. Because someone on your team that was healthy when you drafted them is going to end up hurt after the first two to three weeks of this season. I don't know if it's going to be a big one. I hope it's not. I hope it's a turned ankle and they're out for two weeks. But it could be bigger than that. I, I'm just trying to think back off the top of my head of all the guys that ended up missing time early last year. Hassan Whiteside was out for a while early. Uh, obviously, Gordon Hayward, but you could drop him. Nico Miritic got his face punched in right before the season started, and he was out for many weeks. Paul Millsap, about a month into the year, he got knocked out for three months. So the guys that you're talking about, these injury stashes, are Boogie and KP. Those are the two. There's really... The other guys are supposed to be back pretty early on. Devin Booker, Russell Westbrook, whoever. They're, they don't count. It's, it's Boogie and it's KP. I'm not drafting them in any format other than a potential keeper or dynasty situation where you can get them really late and then maybe hold them over for the following year at a steep discount. That, to me, the ROI is there. But getting a quarter of a year or a half a season sacrificing a roster spot, that's the critical part. Because someone on your team is going to get hurt, you're going to want to move them to the injured reserve, and you're not going to be able to because there's going to be a guy in there. So the rest of your team has to be of just optimal health, and you have no control over that, and it's just not going to happen. Someone's going to get hurt, and you're going to want a place to put them, and you're not going to be able to. So don't do it unless you can keep that guy KP or Boogie or whoever, you know, if you can get him in the ninth, 10th round this year and you can keep him at a 7th or 8th round price for next season, then I would do it. Otherwise, not touching him. We're going to take a break from the mailbag because we can. (laughs) It's my show. I can do what I want in that regard. And we'll just break up the questions a little bit and then come back to them in just a moment. He is Chef. He is Ali. He is not both together. He is one, he is the other, but he is not both. He is Floppy Devots as well. You have so many names. I got to take a line from the Devil's Advocate. And he is a guest on the podcast today. The debut run for Hoopball's very own pro, The Chef. What's up, my man? Welcome to the show. What's up, Dan? Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's it's a long time coming, too, because I remember when you first started writing for Hoopball, and I read some of your stuff, and I was like, oh, I really... And, and, and I hope that you know I'm not just throwing this around just because, but your stuff has... It has a certain flair to it. Do you know that you type with a certain flair? Yes, I do, Dan. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. I love it. The thing that bugged me more than anything... Uh, in reading fantasy stuff for many years was how uh, banal, I guess, to pull out... <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta go pedantic on today's show. To, <laughs> was how banal some of the stuff was, where it was just like, oh, here's you know, here's this weekend recap, and it was like, Kevin Durant had a big game. I'm like, this is stupid. I don't want to read this. This is boring. This is not helpful. Uh, and then, so I feel like when I read someone who... It sounds like you're enjoying what you're writing as you're writing it. And for me, as because I'm over here on the, the talk, 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 talk side, uh, where I have to like the sound of my own voice, uh, which makes me a little bit of a narcissist, and I'm okay with that. Do you, like, as you're writing your stuff, are you finishing sentences and like, okay, that was pretty funny, I like that? <laughs> or is it just like, it all comes out of you, and then you're done, and you're like, all right, on to the next thing? Oh, definitely, yeah. Like, you know, I'll even crack myself up sometimes when I'm writing or I'll have a thought during the week, you know, I'll just make a little note of it and find somewhere to try to slide it into the the weekly waiver column or, you know, whatever. So I want to give people a little bit of a of a background on you. Um, 
the Twitter handle, the names, all of that stuff. What? Who are you? What? What? What is this? You have like you have all these pseudonyms. Who? Who are you? How did you get into fantasy sports? Where did the nicknames come from? How did you end up with hoop ball? What's the origin story for uh, floppy divots for chef? Obviously, the origin story for Ali is because that's your name. But the other ones in particular, give everybody a little background on on the uh, the expert, how you became a hoop ball pro, and how you got into fantasy and all that good stuff. Well, the well, I guess to start off, yeah, Ali is my birth name, and <laughs> Chef came while I was in college. I was trying to cook something up for my roommates and myself, and uh, I just kept on, you know, experimenting and playing around, seeing what I could throw together, and it. One of my roommates called me Chef Boy Ali, and then it just eventually shortened to Chef. So that's where you get the Chef from. And now, Floppy Divas is even older, you know, from when Divas used to play in the league, and he was one of the first Euros to introduce the magical style that we now call flopping. So <laughs> one of my buddies just came up with the with the name, hey, there's Floppy Divas out there flopping on the court. So this and is I when you were actually up. playing. This is while I was well, while we were watching the game. Ah, okay. So how did that end up as your Twitter handle? You must have because you didn't join Twitter until like a year and a half ago, I think. Yeah. Well, I just I don't know. I figured I wanted something somewhat unique, and I saw a lot of you know fake names like you know Scotty Pimpin or Scotty Drippin or whatever. <laughs> so I just said, hey, we'll go with Floppy Divas. All right. What about the hoop ball side? How did you end up? sort of on the other side of the wall. How, how long have you been playing fantasy sports? How did you get into it? Uh, give me a little more on the background. I've been playing since 2006, kind of just on a whim with some buddies of mine, with the, the floppy divas buddies that all watch the game together. And I just started playing more and more, and it was kind of starting out a little bit slowly, you know, just with my buddies, and then eventually I got into other leagues, and that's when I really became serious about it, probably around eight years ago. And then what about the hoop ball side? Oh, that's on you, man. That's on me? What did I do? I, you, I, saw, I saw you posting right when I started my Twitter account, and uh, I was looking for some summer summer stuff to get me through the, the dry season, and I stumbled apro- across your podcast, and then I added you, and you said, hey, we're looking for contributors. If you want to get on some pods or do some writing or whatever, holler at me. So I hollered at Dan. I'll be darned. That's kind of fun. I didn't. I don't think I even knew that I was the the reason behind. That. I probably did at some point, but I have to admit, this was how long ago was this? Was this uh, was this last year? Was this two years ago? I forget now. They blend together a little bit. Yeah, it was right after the beginning of last season. Okay, so I'm going to drop the Asher excuse because, and I've used this with family members too. It doesn't. It doesn't just apply to. Uh, to the podcast, I remember nothing from my child's first year of life. And so it's quite conceivable that you and I had an extended conversation, and I have no recollection of it. But, what? okay, so let me ask you this then. You've now written for Hoop Ball for the better part of a, of a calendar year, it sounds like. What do people, yep. what do you think would surprise some people about sort of working on the other side of the wall? Is it the blurb shifts? I know it's, it's more work than people realize. It's a lot more work, yeah. Even than myself, than I realized, or I was expecting. But it's real fun, and uh, I like it. But yeah, the blurbs is definitely, uh, especially, you know, when there's a lot of injuries, like during preseason or during last season, even Panda was telling me, like, man, we usually don't get this many injuries, you know, on an average Friday, because I do double blurb shift Fridays. And yeah, it's pretty exhausting. Have you now, been- the writing is not exhausting, it just takes a lot of time. Yeah, have you? Do you have a background in writing? Is this something that you've done for a long time? Because you seem very comfortable with it. Yeah, I started out. Uh, well, originally I started out doing you know short stories as a kid. I spent uh, the majority of my twenties, I guess, wasting my life trying to be a professional rapper slash producer. And I also wrote screenplays for several years. So yeah, I have a lot of experience. I guess kind of broad based hmm. in the using the written word. Sweet. That's uh, that's an interesting background, right? I love that everybody at Hoopball has sort of a different way of getting into it. it that's uh, it adds something to the mix. So okay, so I'm going to jump straight ahead. The real reason, the 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 real meat of why I wanted to get you on the podcast is what's going on in the Hoopball forums right now. And this is a little bit of a promo, but it's also a little bit of a. I think this is something that people listening to the show might enjoy. You are basically right now hosting 
a thread in the Hoopball forums where people can post their teams. So when they finish a mock draft or a real draft, whatever it might be, they post their roster in that thread and you're breaking it down for them. I find that incredibly difficult. Can you can you kind of elucidate how you're able to see the name? I mean, it feels very uh, beautiful mindy to me. Like you can see these names dancing around in your head and you're like, "Oh, not enough assists." How do you how do you do that? How do you put that together? Well, I have to be honest, Dan. I first start off, of course, using our wonderful Hoopball Roto Balance draft app. Mm. But aside from that, it, I think it, a lot of it just boils down to experience. Like, you know, I know kind of how team construction should work. Um, and especially specifically for H2H, like, you know, I'm deep into the, the schedule. So I look at that. I look at the the schedule. I also, of course, use my own proprietary blend of bias <laughs> or pre- personal preference, if you would prefer. And I just kind of throw it all together, mix it around and. There you go. Well, I was just really, I was enthused because this was something that I wanted to see happen at HoopBall. And I actually, I personally, I started the thread so people can know that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there was no plan on any one person to sort of grab the reins on it. My hope was that it would end up being a little bit of crowdsourcing. But you hopped in and you broke down like six teams right out of the chute. And so you and I emailed a little bit. I was like, listen... You know, if you want to take ownership of this thing, go for it. And it has blown up. I think you've broken down, as of the time of our recording this podcast, I think you've broken down like 45 or 50 teams. Does that sound right? I don't know. It feels like a couple hundred thousand, but... It's like, you know, beep, boop, beep, boop, does not compute. <laughs> this, one, this one guy on there yesterday, like, didn't I review this team already? Because he had, like, the, the first four or five players the same as another team that I had reviewed. Well, it says... So, yeah, it's kind of blending together a little bit, but, you know, I'm trying, trying to keep focused. That's incredible. I don't know how you can keep up. There's been 47. I just bothered to look it up while we're talking. There's been 47 different teams and 130-some-odd posts in this forum thread over just a couple of days if you're out there, folks, if you're listening to the podcast and you have a team and you want a hoop ball pro to break it down, Chef is doing it right now. It's just going. There's a, Since your last reply, which was, I think, like an hour and 40 minutes ago, there have been another three and a half. No, yeah, I'm going to go three and a half because one person posted a team with their first five picks and basically said, <laughs> what should I do with my next nine? So now they're they're asking you to do their draft for them in the middle of the draft. That's not really the point of this thread, but it's happening. Uh, and so if you're out there and you want to get your team broken down, Chef is doing it. Uh, is this, this feels like kind of an interesting exercise. Does this put team build in sort of a new light for you like is this is breaking down other people's teams allowing you to see things about how teams are being built right now and kind of help you in your own drafting in any way i would say not really just because i'm kind of so plugged in already i think that's why i can actually do it so easy because i've done literally over 300 mocks oh my god before i started my regular draft so are you serious? Three hundred? I'm, like I'm like Adrian. Yeah, I like to go in there and pretty much I can close my eyes and you know not get freaked out because I'm the type of person Dan that if I'm not prepared, uh, you know I get a little nervous or I might feel a little bit unsure. So if I'm 100 percent prepared, then man, I'm just ready to roll. Okay, so this came up now and now we got to talk about it. Three hundred mock drafts is freaking nuts. Tell me uh, some of the things that you've picked up as kind of big picture ideas from doing this many drafts? Are there things you're noticing about centers or point guards or wings or guys that were or are, or are currently still sleepers? Is there a position that you like to be drafting more than others? What, what are you picking up? Cause you've done more drafts yourself than a lot of our listeners do combined on this thing. 300 is crazy. Well, I like, I'm kind of like you. I like to, at least this season, I think if you draft kind of in like the five, six range, you're still almost guaranteed a quality player and you don't have to reach too much, you know, by the time your next picks come around. So, but I don't mind drafting from the early spots. Not a big fan of drafting from the late spots, although you can get a lot of value with like Westbrook and Kawhi in some leagues, Paul George, Depot. I've seen these guys fall in several leagues at the turn, which I'll just, you know, pick them up. What do you think people need? You're a head-to-head expert, so what do you think people need to know going into head-to-head drafts this year? Um, I think they want to kind of have like a, a good plan. What I've noticed on a lot of the teams that I've been reviewing is that, uh, how do I want to say this? 
Well, I guess like you know, if you start out with a with a cat or a Steph, and you know, you build up some other guys, and then you take you know like a DeAndre Jordan in the sixth. So that pretty much just crushes your free throw percentage, which is you know the opposite of what you want to be doing. Or maybe it's the opposite. You have a strong field goal percentage, and one guy on the forum, I think he picked up uh, Dennis Smith Jr. and Aaron Fox like back to back. I'm like, dude, that just kills your your field goal percentage and your free throw and your turnovers. So I think uh, most owners probably want to have a better idea of actual roster construction and team build as opposed to just you know just picking random names. That sounds pretty good to me. Everybody, go check out the forum thread. It's kicking. Dan, if I can say, of sorry, course. if I can mention yeah, please. one thing. More, more. Yeah, the more the better here. One thing I've noticed, which I never usually do because when I play basketball, I like to pass. But I've noticed that there's been a lot of assist punting bills this season. Hmm. Why do you think and, that is? Um, I just think with the way that NBA offenses tend to be more spread out and share the ball, that there's not a lot of, you know, solely ball dominant guards like a John Wall or a Chris Paul. Hmm. So I think, you know, like the the lesser guys like the Darren Collisons or Dennis Smith Juniors, you know, they're not getting the, you know, seven, eight assists that a lesser point guard might have gotten maybe 10 years ago. So kind of to piggyback off that, if you can get yourself, you know, even a decent assist guy in the first couple of rounds, you don't have to go all out for assists. But I think you can like probably beat half the teams in your league who are punting or default punting or soft punting just by having, you know, some some modicum of assists on your squad. Yeah, I'm actually inclined to agree with you a little bit. It does seem like the drop off in in point guard quality this year is significant. Like you've got that first tier of point guard style players, and then the second tier to me feels like it's a big step back. Whereas, yet you know, obviously you've got your AD and your Cat up at the top, and I'm not going to say that there are other centers out there that really compare to those two guys. But it does seem like there's a second tier, a second chunk of centers. If you want to roll Embiid in with guys like Rudy Gobert and Andre Drummond and Clint Capella, and you know Embiid's going a little bit before those other guys, but it feels like you can get some centers in the late second, the third, maybe even the fourth, whereas if you wait to get your point guard in the third or fourth round, you're looking at guys that just aren't as aren't even close to as reliable and give kind of a, a, a different stat set. Am I reading that right? Because I actually haven't had any of my money league drafts yet. That's my interpretation exactly. And even outside of, you know, like the early rounds, like, you know, you can pick up some, you know, hopefully white side, maybe some canters in the middle rounds. There's, you know, JJJ, we got, you know, John Isaacs, Jordan Bell, other guys towards the later end of the rounds. Whereas if you look at point guards, you know, who am I going to pick up in the 10th round? You know, DJ Augustine, there's not a lot of options that that either don't have major flaws or big question marks. Absolutely. Uh, anything else? I didn't mean to cut you off before. Okay, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> uh, he is Chef. He is Floppy Divots on Twitter. Although, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, there's an underscore in there. It's Floppy underscore Divots. D-I-V-A-C. It's spelled like the name. I know it's pronounced Divots. I know that can be misleading, but it's D-I-V-A-C. Floppy underscore Divots. Check him out. He is Chef. He is Ali. He is a hoop ball pro, and he is rating your teams. And if I'm not mistaken, you got a coupon code. That's associated with all the products over at Hoop Ball. We've got the draft guide still available. We've got the season pass still available. We've got the in-season premium membership since we're getting so close to opening day. What is that coupon code? That coupon code is CHEF. Hey, That's CHEF, C-H-E-F, CHEF. C-H-E-F. We're keeping it easy here on Fantasy NBA Today. Why Why mess around with the, a good thing? CHEF, thanks so much for coming on. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here for a first time. My pleasure, Dan. I appreciate you having me on. Keep kicking you've, ass and taking names. you made my names. dreams come true. <laughs> Between you and Adrian and Neil, you guys are going to give me a big head, which would be a problem <laughs> because I have a very small body. Uh, he is chef, <laughs> and he is, he is the team raider, man. You're going to get yourself a, a fresh nickname here to add to the list. Again, you can go to the HoopBall forums, hoop-ball.com. Click on the forums tab. It is stickied to the top, but it doesn't need to be because it's getting posted in literally every 20 minutes right now. It's one of the biggest threads we've ever had at Hoop Ball. Chef, awesome job on that. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Dan. See you later, man. That was Chef. He talks fast. He works fast. He breaks down your team fast. I love that thread. I love that thread so much. As I was recording this podcast... 
four more teams got posted in that thread. This is insane. I don't think I've ever seen the forum act like this. I mean, it, it, it's it's glorious. It's what you envision when you build a fantasy forum is this type of activity level. I talked to Chef earlier today, recorded one segment of this show. This is the magic of editing. And now I'm recording the end of the show in the evening. And now there are 64 teams in the thread. 64 different people have asked him to rate their team. There have been 182 posts in this thread. This is nuts. This is nuts. Uh, go check it out. You got to check it out. Hoop-ball.com. Click on the forums tab. It's right up there at the top. It is hopping. It's hopping. Let's get back to the mailbag. Last few questions here. I think we got like four or five left. This is from Dynamic Basti. I would like your thoughts on John Wall and Hassan Whiteside. Last year, both were early second round picks. Now they are late second and fifth rounds, respectively. They're not that old. Is it just a one-off bad year for each of them? I feel a little bit differently about the two players involved in this thing. With John Wall, I think we've seen kind of this exposure of as he loses some of his explosiveness, his field goal percent is going to be the thing that really suffers the most. And at a high volume, it's pretty soul-crushing. Remember, John Wall has never been a very good three-point shooter. He takes more of them now than he used to. He's up to 37% this last year, which was pretty good for him. But the, the real dip for Wall, last year in particular, was that he wasn't very good from two-point land. He only played in 41 games. That was also a problem. But he only shot 43.5% from two what do I make of all this? Well, I do think that you'll see a little bit of a bounce back. Last year was his worst shooting season since his rookie campaign. And I say, you know, you know three-pointers are a much bigger part of the game. Yeah, he's been taking about four three-pointers a game for five years in a row, roughly. There was one year where it was less than that and one year where it was more. But over that stretch, he shot 43, 44.5, 42.5, 45, and then 42%. So this was the low end of that spectrum. Some of that is just sort of st statistical regression stuff, and some of it was the fact that he just wasn't healthy this last year. But his steals were down. I think those will come back a little bit. His free throw percentage was just awful, worst of his career by a lot. I think he's in a good spot in that I've actually seen him go much later than end of the second round. I mean, I've seen him go in the third, fourth rounds at times this year, and if he's falling that far, I think he's a pretty good grab in most leagues, despite the fact that he is going to be a very high turnover guy. Because I don't think he's going to shoot 42% again. I mean, he might see 43, which isn't exactly great, but it's better. I think everything that you're going to see this year is going to be just a hair better because, you, you know, you might see some assists to Dwight Howard on the interior that could actually help him. He's not reliant on being able to rebound. He's not reliant on protecting the rim. He doesn't need to necessarily have the, the easiest lane. John Wall gets to the bucket in transition. Dwight Howard's not going to be clogging it up in that regard. I do think Dwight's going to mess things up for this team, although <laughs> he's out with a sore butt right now. I think John Wall's going to be an okay value this year. I think Hassan Whiteside is a great value this year. And the screwy thing when you talk about these two players, this is a really good question because it highlights two interesting categories in that Wall didn't take the same hit year over year, even though this is the weird note on, on all of this stuff. John Wall was number 59 in 9-cat last year, and Hassan Whiteside was 39. He was two rounds better than John Wall, and he's falling like a stone in the ocean. I think Hassan Whiteside is one of the best draft picks this season because of how far he's fallen. I think John Wall will be an okay one. I don't want him. He's not my cup of tea. But if he fell to me, 
third, fourth round, yeah, I think I'd take a shot. LBJ in my veins cracked off a long question here. I'll try to fire it all off together. Have you watched any late uh, Clippers preseason games? No. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to watch uh, Shy Gilgis Alexander play, but how soon can you see him being relevant? Would Mitchell Robinson be sooner? Uh, for Gilgis Alexander, I would say not that soon. Clippers have a glut of guard-like players on that team, so they're not going to rush him along unless they go into tank mode, which I don't see happening early, not with guys like Patrick Beverly and Avery Bradley and Danilo Gallinari and Tobias Harris and Martian Gortat. They have a starting five of old farts. It's not kid time yet. Mitchell Robinson, I would say, will be sooner because I think you see the Knicks go into a massive tank rebuild uh, as soon as they find out Chris Tops is never coming back. And what are your thoughts on Super Mario Hazonia as a whole with news that Lance Thomas is set to start? I don't believe Lance Thomas is the long-term starter for this team. It sounds like he understands defensive rotations better, but that's a thing that's going to end up taking a back seat as they too realize they're not going to be competitive on a night-to-night basis and they give the guy they gave a little bit of money to a chance to go prove himself a little bit. This is uh, from Jay Punsalan. Six, tell us your thoughts on Derrick Rose. He kills percentages, but where would you take him in the draft? Last pick? Is Josh Richardson more valuable after a potential Jimmy Butler trade? I would not. This is like full-on Dr. Seuss. I would not, could not draft Derrick Rose. I could not, would not draft Derrick Rose. Not in a house, not with a mouse. I have a two-year-old. Is that not obvious? Don't draft Derrick Rose outside of a points format. And even then... Ugh, he is brutal. He is brutal. Points leagues only. Ugh. Is Josh Richardson more valuable after the Butler trade? Eh, about the same. About the same. He's not an alpha. He's not going to push his way past Dion Waiters, so then he's definitely not going to push his way past Andrew Wiggins. I would say, if anything, his value might even take a slight hit because the guys in Minnesota, Jeff Teague, I mean, he'd be a fourth option at best on that team without grabbing life by the horns, and he's just not that type of player. Paper Vaz, one of our longtime listeners, says, Can you rank Dwayne Dedman, Jakob Pertl, JaVal McGee, and Willie Hernan Gomez? Uh, Pertl's last on that list for me. I can tell you that right out of the chute. Dedman is extremely boring, but in nine cat, he's probably the first ranked in that group, if only because I think you can just sort of sit on him being a top 95 guy when he's on the floor. Guys that I'd actually take, because I'm hoping not to get to a point where I need Dwayne Dedman to be my second center. You should have your two long before you get to that. So by this point in the draft, you sort of want to eliminate the 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 guys that are just quietly sitting at number 100, you want to take some shots, like around the 100 to 115 mark. So I think I might consider uh, going Willie Hernan Gomez first in that group, then JaVale McGee, then Deadman, and then Jakob Pertl way down at the end of the list. Who is your... Oh, this is a good one. Still from Paper Vaz, second half of the question, unrelated. Who is the dark horse to be the number one overall fantasy player this year. Dark horse. Well, I think it's safe to say that it's going to come out of the top six names. Anthony Davis, James Harden, Carl Anthony Towns, the two Warriors, Stephen KD, and Giannis. Those are your six. Anthony Davis is obviously the lead dog. He's the odds-on favorite to be your number one player. A lot of people think Carl Anthony Towns has a chance to get there because of games played. Maybe he could leapfrog some people if he actually gets to all 82 again this year. I don't think he will. And I don't think that really makes him a dark horse. I think if you wanted to call somebody a dark horse, I think you'd have to make it someone like Steph Curry or Kevin Durant. Someone on this Warriors team where they're just like, ah, they're not going to play all their games. They don't have to go full bore in the regular season. But besides Anthony Davis, the only other guy to be the per-game number one fantasy player over the last couple of years is Kevin Durant. 
He did it. He was number one until he got hurt. And there were stretches this most recent season where Steph was number one until he got hurt. So I think your Warriors are your dark horses. These are guys that are falling to five, six, seven in drafts, and you could end up with the number one guy. If I have the first pick, I'm still going AD because I think percentages indicate he's your best bet. But I believe the Warriors actually have a better path to number one than James Harden. I think I'd probably still take Towns over them, especially if Butler is getting moved anytime soon because it does feel like he has a great nine-category profile and KD ends up hurt. But Steph is probably my third pick. I like that one. That was a fun one. Last question for the mailbag from our boy Andre. How is hoop ball so awesome? That's pandering, Andre, and I won't answer it. Also, stats to look for on the top of the draft versus stats that are easier to find later. Categorical scarcity, he puts in parentheses. I got you, buddy. And who to look for in the end of rounds two, three, and four to uh, who can help address that scarcity. Well, blocks, for one. Blocks are intensely difficult to find these days. It's a, it's a statistical category where you can make up an, a crazy amount of ground with one or two guys that block shots. And it, and it sits on this fulcrum where last year it actually already had, had begun. I had, who did I have on my team last year? I had Miles Turner and I had Kevin Durant on one fantasy team. And I was blocking shots, and I had this massive lead in Roto. Nobody was close. And so I traded Miles Turner near the midway point, and I faded so fast it was nuts. Like, you, just one guy can make that big of a difference. I went from way out in first place to, like, fifth place in a month and a half. And then I noticed this was happening, and so I addressed it with weird little late-season oh, this clown's going to play 30 minutes tonight type of pickups. And I was able to recapture some of what I had lost. But blocks, you got to get some blocks early. It's why I believe this year you want a point guard in the first two rounds and you want your two centers. You could get them in the third and the fourth if you want. Because, you know, odds are if you don't have a top seven pick, you're not going to get a center in the first round. And unless you're willing to reach on Joel Embiid, you're not going to get one in the second round. So in the third, you're looking at guys like Draymond Green, who blocks some shots. You're looking at guys like Clint Capella. I don't think Rudy Gobert is going to fall quite far enough. Maybe Andre Drummond. In the fourth round, you're looking at guys like uh, Nick Vucevic. You're looking at DeAndre Ayton. You're looking at John Collins, who's going too early in my estimation. You're looking at Marc Gasol. You're looking at Al Horford. And if you really went all the way to the fifth round, you're looking, I think, at Whiteside and Ennis Cantor. So you kind of need to get it by there. If you don't have two centers by the time Ennis, Ennis Cantor comes off the board, you are screwed. Oh, Miles Turner's probably going somewhere in there. But if you don't have it by Ennis Cantor, your options then become uh, punt guys like Steven Adams, DeAndre Jordan, Dwight Howard, Jonas Valanciunas, who doesn't block many shots, but he's a good percentages guy. Dwayne Dedman, who we just talked about, is Captain Boring. Yusuf Nurkic, who I think is actually going to be a decent value this year, but not a, not a good center. He's going to kill you in free throws. Brooke Lopez, Kelly Olynyk, guys like that. That You don't want to build around those dudes. So I think there's a way to do it. I think you can basically guarantee, it, as long as you set your sights on it, you can get two centers, one in the third, one in the fourth. If you have a late first-round pick, so basically, if you're not going to get Nikola Jokic in the first round, let's say you have picks 8 through 12, a center's not falling to you in that first round. I'm not a buyer on Embiid in the top 15. Top 18, maybe? Uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. Between free throws and turnovers and 9-cat, he's, he's tough. And we still haven't seen him crack. What did he play last year? 60 63 games, something like that. 63 games. He was number 31 in nine cat. So much buzz, and he wasn't even inside the top 30. 
So if you have a late pick in the first round, you're probably going to end up with a point guard and a wing or two point guards or two guards. And I'm actually okay with that because I think that that once you get past Kyle Lowry, the point guard quality just gets terrible, brutally awful. Maybe Mike Conley pans out, and that's it. Then you get into these weird, funky middle round dudes. Anyway, I'm talking myself into a loop here. Uh, Andre, my thought on this is top of the draft, first round or two, you're looking for assists. Rounds one through four, you're looking for centers who can block shots and not kill you in free throws. So, you know, Andre Drummond maybe fits into that category, maybe not. Uh, And I think I missed, I, I didn't answer the question earlier about who I reach for in the middle round. Don't reach for anybody, guys. If you're playing this thing to have particular dudes on your fantasy team, you're gonna have a tougher time winning. Don't reach. The whole point is let guys come to you. If you're reaching, you're squeezing value out. And that's your mailbag. That's your mailbag. That's your last mailbag before the regular season begins. Don't worry, we'll do this periodically during the actual season, but just not right now. Uh, Again, tomorrow, we're going to have Neil Rochelani on the show. He's going to tell us about the box score breakdown coming back from the dead. He's going to give us an update on what he's been doing since we last spoke to him here on the show. And then Friday, we're talking to Brew. And then Monday... Monday, crap, we'll be a day away from basketball. I think Monday we'll talk about, I have two Roto money drafts over the weekend, so we'll probably break those bad boys down. We're going to talk to Russ Peddle at some point in the not-too-distant future. Uh, Jonas Nader is going to be on the podcast. We got potentially Lakers Film Room coming on the show. It's going to be a really nice stretch coming up as well. Whatever, whatever, we'll get it all to you. The countdown continues, my friends, six days until the start of the NBA season. Thanks again for listening to everybody. Please, please, please subscribe to Fantasy NBA Today. Please subscribe to Fantasy NBA Today. I am Dan Vespers. Have a wonderful Wednesday. We'll talk to you tomorrow. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.